always said the Black Panther Party that they can do anything they want to to us. We might not be back. I might be in jail. I might be anywhere. But when I leave, you can remember I said with the last words on my lips that I am a revolutionary. Hey everyone, my name is Andre Walton, the Southeast Regional Organizer for OWR, and welcome to the Revolution. Today, my guest is Teddy Shababa, activist and organizer for Socialist Alternatives. How are you doing today, Teddy? I'm I'm doing very well, considering uh, all the you know insanity that's happening. Um, how are you today? I'm doing good. So uh, I got a chance to go to a few protests. Uh, luckily, they were very peaceful. There was no. Um, you know, violence or, or uh, anything broken. Uh, but overall, it was mm. it was really good. Um, and it was for a good cause. You know, it was, it was there was one for George Floyd, Floyd and another one for um, another man named jo, uh, Joel Aficendo. Um And a lot of people don't okay. know about that situation. But um, he yeah, I have not heard. Of that. Yeah, we can definitely talk about that. But he went through okay. a similar situation as, as George did. But um, yeah, the reason why I want to bring you on today is to really talk about the recent situations, uh, get your <laughs> perspective on it as an as a fellow organizer and activist, and uh, yeah, let's just get into it. So obviously, we're talking about a, a very important topic, and that's about you know the death of George Floyd and systematic <laughs> racism that has led us to this point. And I think it's really safe to say that George Floyd, the death of George Floyd, really sparked uh, these protests that we're seeing. But it's it's not as a result of a single event. Like this isn't on a one-off. This is a, a manifestation of of years and years of police brutality and the killing mm -hmm. of innocent people and, in particular, uh, black men and women. Um, can you kind of talk about uh, the frustration that that that's going into these protests and and the ignorance of elected officials that led us to this topic? Sure. Um... I mean, it's it's true that the uh, everyone watching the video of uh, George having his uh, life snatched from him in such a, a gruesome, uh, like almost calm manner by uh, the officers, you know, with the main officer with his uh, hands in his pocket, just completely unconcerned. Uh, but this also comes. Uh, you know, after uh, people have watched like uh, other similar uh, cases in Louisville, uh, Kentucky, where there was a no-knock raid um, and a black woman uh, was killed. Um, and then you had, uh, you know, um, I, th I think her name was Brianna. I uh, can't remember exactly uh, the rest of it, but and there's uh, Ahmed um, uh, that was like shot by the two oh, yeah, uh, Ahmad Arbery, yeah. Ahmad Arbery, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so and then there was the whole uh, dog walking Karen incident uh, exactly. in New York City. So all of this was happening at the same time, but I think the reason. You, you saw it explode in the way that it did is because of the backdrop of COVID-19, uh, you know, and the new economic depression that we are basically getting into. Uh, you have a situation where mass unemployment has reached a level uh, where, like, the Great Depression uh, of the 1930s it took like four or five years for the unemployment level to get to how quickly it's gotten, you know, this time around in just a couple of months. Uh, but I think it's also like a very um, COVID-19 was like the, the immediate trigger for the collapse, but it was a systemic crisis that was, um, coming anyways, uh, pretty much, because the big banks, Fortune 500 and the, uh, and the government that they control didn't really fix the crisis from 2008. They papered over it and just helped out the bankers and the investors, and everybody else was still suffering, even though we had supposedly an economic recovery. 
And of course, both in that situation and COVID-19, uh, the section of the working class that suffered the most uh, was the black and brown working class uh, that tends to be concentrated in the, you know, both uh, the service industry, which, you know, because of the situation with coronavirus, there was a lot of businesses that shut down and people were unemployed. And then you had a situation also where the so-called essential or frontline workers who have to be at work, um, where the bosses didn't give a damn about, you know, how well protected their workforce was. All they cared about was the 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 continued operation of the profit engine, and you know, even in that situation, you had a certain concentration of black and brown workers uh, that got especially impacted. But it's also the case that. Uh, a very large section of uh, low-income workers of, of all uh, racial backgrounds um, were heavily impacted. I think the, the callousness with which uh, the bosses treated workers, uh, that literally putting profit and property over human lives was really revealing for a lot of uh, working people that previously be, maybe... Um, didn't, didn't totally see it that way. Um, and on top of that, you have a situation where uh, the police were using uh, the stay-at-home orders to especially enforce, uh, you know, uh, against, like, communities of color uh, where they were arresting or uh, troubling or harassing, um, you know, folks in that way. And also just the impact of quarantine and staying in and not being able to just the fact that it was not really possible uh, as much to express the mass outrage uh, until now. Mm -hmm. So there's a certain kind of pent up uh, anger. And so I'm not one to uh, condemn any so-called uh, violence or disruption that's come uh, from the protesters. Um, I mean, maybe if we were in a strategy room uh, where we were discussing strategy and tactics, I might not immediately advocate for that. Uh, but I think uh, <laughs> the, the best example was, uh, was expressed by actually a, a restaurant owner in, uh, in Minneapolis of Gandhi Mahal uh, whose business was uh, was essentially burned down, but he basically said, let my building burn, justice must be served, uh, we can rebuild, uh, you know, buildings, we can't rebuild uh, human lives, you know. Uh, so, and it's also kind of how the system, people get angry about the manner in which people are protesting, but not really the larger systemic uh, injustice. And when I say people, I'm just talking about the the media, the, the politicians, all of the sort of people who, you know, are like self-appointed arbiters of morality and ethics and, and whatnot. They were not as angry at the racial injustice as they are disgusted by the manner in which people are protesting mm -hmm. but even like the way in which things were quote unquote looted or or destroyed it's a kind of like an f you to the idea that property is more important than our human lives mm -hmm. uh, the burning of the police precincts and things like that is an expression of that mm -hmm. uh, but now it, it's a question of like okay we have had this new massive like urban rebellion taking place but what will actually be required to win like lasting change um on like you know basically police accountability police violence um institutional racism and economic injustice all of which are wrapped up together and i think you have seen 
the so-called quote unquote riots have achieved something, which is that uh, the, uh, the the main officer who had his knee on uh, George Floyd's neck has been arrested uh, and charged far more quickly than would have otherwise occurred, I think. Um, and he's been charged with, of course, the weakest charge that he could, you know, uh, which is third degree murder in, in, in Minnesota. Um, uh, but yeah, uh, in, in my opinion, he should probably be charged with either first or second degree murder. Uh, but the other three officers also need to be arrested, exactly. uh, and charged. So anyway, uh, so yeah, I think that's a start to how I'm thinking about these things. Yeah. I mean, I think you brought up a very interesting point and that's how our current system values property over uh, human life. And that, and that's just showing exposing late stage, late stage capitalism for what it really is. I mean, going back to COVID a little bit, we're seeing that corporations are getting endless bailouts. They're getting all the handouts, Jeff Bezos and Facebook CEO, Jeff, um, or Mark Zuckerberg are becoming richer over this time. So it's a culmination of people who aren't being represented in, in uh, their representation. They're not, they're not getting bailouts for the humans. I mean, $1,200 doesn't really do anything besides put a patch over a huge wound. And then, right. and then you have the culmination of continuous racism on top of that. And it's just, it's just literally the perfect storm. Um, but I think, it's, yep. I mean, that really goes into to, to the point that I want to make that every generation has its breaking point. And up to this point, mm -hmm. we haven't really seen our generation's breaking point. Um, in the <coughs> 1950s, we've seen this with the Civil Rights Movement, with the death of Emmett Till. I mean, they had mm -hmm. Jim Crow laws back then, but the Emmett Till death really set it to a new level. And then we've seen it again in the 19, I believe it was the 1980s or 1990s with Rodney King and he was beaten and we've seen riots after that i mean we're seeing history repeat itself and i think it's very important that we or we have elected officials who tend to this very sensitively and do not ignore it because they're basically saying your pain doesn't matter your mm -hmm. your voice doesn't matter and we've been saying we've been singing the same song for generations and yet we're still seeing a continuation of the same problems, just in a different form. Uh, yes. And I think we really have to understand why the riots are occurring rather than just condemning the riots. Okay. How do we get to this point? It's not, yeah. like I said at the beginning, it's not out of the blue. It didn't just rise up because somebody was mad and just felt like breaking windows. It, it is mm -hmm. a culmination of years of frustration, oppression and police brutality. And this is not just a black issue itself. I mean, many white people have been been killed as well by the police. So that's why I think there are many white people who are out here protesting as well because they're sick of yep. it. They're sick of it and they're yep. fed up with it. I mean, Absolutely. I mean, <laughs> I didn't really have a question there, but I just I no, just no, that's, to talk that's about fine. it. <laughs> yeah. No, that's 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 really real. Um, I mean, a, another as far as generations and breaking points. I think we also need to look to um, what what happened with the Black Freedom Movement in the 1930s and 40s, which kind of set the stage for the 1950s and 60s, um, because at that point in time, it, it was, in fact, uh, like much more connected with working class struggle. Um, you know, you had, there was a famous case of the Scottsboro Boys, uh, you know, who were uh, falsely charged and, you know, but there was a big development of struggle there. So I think we need to look to that too, which is, it's looked at less than the situation with the, with the 60s and so on. But yeah, just coming back to now, I think, yeah, basically... In a way, the messed up way in which uh, the government responded to uh, the coronavirus situation, 
uh, they shot themselves in the foot because they kind of Pre previously, they, they kind of rely on a sort of divide and conquer strategy by uh, using um, racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, you know, all the phobias you can think of. Um, and that way, they kind of like have us fighting amongst each other or, uh, you know, looking to each other as the cause of our problems as opposed to looking at the real enemy, the real problem, uh, which is the tiny, super rich elite that controls most of the resources. And they are the ones that primarily benefit from all of these institutional forms of oppression because, for instance, they use racism as a way to carry out a generalized austerity and budget cuts, you know, because they have the historic sort of propaganda of, well, it's the, you know, we can't have these uh, mostly poor, undeserving uh, black folk, you know, taking all the welfare money or whatever, but by the same stroke, they cut pro programs that benefit, um, you know, working people of all, uh, of all races, you know. When it comes to education, when it comes to you, how you see uh, schools are being closed, um, you know, uh, especially in black and brown neighborhoods, but also, you know, in low income working class neighborhoods, um, you know, all over. So there's a lot of institutional violence which uses a section of the working class uh, to impose a more generalized attack. Now, yes. You know, we as black workers face pr probably among the most severe um, case of oppression, you know, uh, police violence, uh, economic violence, uh, and so on. Um, but also, like, there's a reason why everyone's it's 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 it. It's, it's in the interest of all workers to fight back against uh, police abuse because, okay, maybe the police are not uh, attacking or repressing uh, ordinary white folks as much as um, they are us right now. Uh, but when people move into a mass movement and, and mass working class struggle, when there's a lot more workplace and neighborhood struggles taking place and when they begin to really threaten capital's interests, then you will see the police being used uh, to oppress and repress those movements, regardless of, you know, which color, uh, you know, historically you've seen when there's been mass strike movements of workers uh, where they've occupied their factories and workplaces You've had the police being acting as strike breakers, even willing to beat up workers, arrest them, and even shoot them in the back, you know, no matter what color uh, they are. So there's a lot of history there that <laughs> should make it very clear to us that the police are not our friends. You know, they're not they're not the friends of any worker. Uh, they're they're our natural enemy, in fact. Um, and they are here to guard, you know, they say to serve and protect, right? There is some truth to that. They serve and protect the ruling class, the capitalist elite, and their order. Uh, and they do that through racism, sexism, uh, you know, enforcing homophobic and transphobic, like, culture, basically. Uh, all of that is a part of it. Yeah, I mean, I've, <laughs> I've never seen a, a police officer beat the head in of a Wall Street banker. <laughs> I think it's safe to say that. <laughs> yeah, I've never yeah. seen that. Um, but it's 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 another that brings up another topic about the 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 power of the police department. It seems mm. like they they blackmail, you know, politicians. If not blackmail, they they have leverage over them. Mm -hmm. uh, we have seen this with the the over militarization of the police. I mean, Obama said he was going to you know, kind of strip that down, but he actually increased it. Mm -hmm. um, and we see that there's not a lot of penalty 
for abusing people. I mean, sometimes things get caught on camera and there might be some ramifications. They might get fired. But think about all that counts in which is not caught on, on, on camera. Mm -hmm. I mean, many, many people. And, and it seems like it's just part of the culture of the police department that it's a us versus them mentality. Like, oh, we're, we're not here. I think one of the things uh, Obama said is the most important thing for a cop to do is get home safely at night. Well, that's that's completely antithetical to their whole purpose of protecting and serve. Their first purpose is to protect the civilians and serve the uh -huh. civilians, and then you get home at night. Yeah. But it's an S versus them mentality, like, oh, I'm just doing what I have to do to get home at night, and if and if that, I don't know. But the yeah. the point I'm making is that there's there's this culture within the the police department of they they're not here to protect us they're here to do a job and that's it and i think until we reform the police department the training the mentality the structure we're going to keep seeing the same issue i mean police in in england don't even carry carry guns and our police right. they, they they seem to be always itching to use a weapon uh of some sort but i mean can you kind of give your take on on the, sure the I guess the overpowering of the police department and they have this badge as a license to kill, so to speak. Mm -hmm. In a way, if you look at it from like a, a certain uh, historical, ideological kind of uh, perspective, um, if the, the police are the, the main internal domestic army of the capitalist class, uh, but in order for those police officers who, you know, they have incomes that are like working class incomes, you know, uh, so for them to be loyal to the ruling class, whether they're not thinking in, t in those terms or not, they of course believe a lot of the propaganda that they spread, um, they have to be given certain privileges, you know. There has to be a double standard for them, right? Like they have a certain freedom to act in whatever way, uh, you know. So they they are – the system understands that it needs them to have as much leeway as possible uh, so that they feel like they are separate from the masses, uh, and separate and above and accountable not to the people, uh, but actually to the, uh, to the bureaucrats and the uh, politicians uh, that control their budgets. And those politicians and bureaucrats are in turn controlled by uh, the corporate donors, the bankers, and so on. Um, when you look at even like the way a lot of like so-called nuisance crimes are, are are enforced, a lot of it is to kind of maintain, you know, order for like the reputation of neighborhoods and uh, you know for for landlords and for the developer class, so that there's more orderly kind of um, situation going on uh, for them to maintain their business. Um, but in terms of, yeah, the power of uh, the police, there's no, like, as long as you have, um, as long as you don't have any real democratic mechanism to control uh, the police department that's separate and, and apart from, from, like, just the mayor's bureaucracy, uh, nothing's really going to change. Um, so you're right. I think that one demand that um, a lot of folks have, you know, at least in the um, anti-police brutality movement have been talking about is uh, community control of police, right? Uh, but what does that mean? Like, um, from my perspective and from Socialist Alternatives' perspective, uh, the way we like to put it is we demand uh, an independent, elected uh, civilian police control board 
that has full powers over police. That means uh, power to hire, fire, discipline, retrain, uh, review budget priorities, uh, and has subpoena power. So that, and it has to be composed of the people, uh, you know, in the neighborhood and in in the area that's being especially impacted and um, facing the, those, uh, you know, those police repressions. So that that's a fundamental challenge to the <laughs> to the power of police. That kind of a powerful demand, and police the, the power of police is in general bound up with the power of the capitalist class. So they're not really going to give up that power easily. <laughs> Because in fact, it, it kind of goes hand in hand with the you know with the system's existence. But I think by extending, by building a movement where that's at the center of our demands, you know, uh, you know, in the immediate sense, we say yes, arrest and indict and charge um, and you know uh, imprison all of these uh, killer cops. Uh, but at the end of the day, we need to build enough like working class power so that we can actually enforce some of these demands. And so we can decrease their power, in fact, by creative forms of solidarity uh, where the broad organizations of the working class can, can have a role. Like, for instance, an initiative that uh, our uh, socialist alternative members took in Minneapolis where uh, we have uh, members of ours that are also uh, part of the uh, bus drivers union, Am Amalgamated Transit Union, uh, Local 1005. The president of the local, Ryan Timlin, is one of our longtime members. Uh, and then one of the drivers, Adam Birch, who uh, heard over uh, the sort of dispatch uh, system that the cops were trying to use uh, the buses to try to like transport people arrested, uh, you know. And as soon as he heard that, basically he started like a petition and a movement to ask uh, other drivers to not take part in that. And it rapidly grew. And then, you know, the union released a statement saying that, um, Drivers were not required to, uh, you know, they, they shouldn't have to uh, pretty much like follow the, the police orders. That's not their job. And that's also like going against their own uh, interests because they are part of that working class. Uh, the people that they transport on a daily basis uh, are a lot of multiracial working class folks. Uh, many of the drivers uh, are also drivers of color. Um, so that's like a, a, a significant leverage we can use to, uh, reduce the impact that police have, uh, by using our working class power in a form of non-cooperation. And so based on the example of the Minneapolis drivers, you saw uh, the same thing happening, uh, in New York city and a number of other places and really a broader sort of petition saying like any of the, you know, uh, no like unionized, uh, uh, you know, service or, or labor should participate um, in police repression. And in fact, should demand, should demand like action against um, institutional racism. Uh, the only way, you know, unions can really kind of revive and build power is if they act not just in the interest of their own members, but actually uh, to help build power for the working class in general, to defend working class in general. And that includes a struggle against um, racist policing, institutional violence coming from police and the law. So, um, so for, that, for that reason, like there are ways to challenge that power. I think both mass, mass protests uh, workplace type actions, but also running uh, candidates that are independent of both corporate political parties that are tied to our movements and accountable to our movements. 
uh, is a key uh, part of that. So we, we can't have any more like politicians that um, that are not like part and parcel of the movement and expressions of the movement. Um, so, you know, elections are important and, you know, candidates are important, but I think like that has to, to be seen as just one part uh, of a powerful grassroots movement uh, with the central strategy being how do we mobilize the social collective power of the working class uh, to disrupt the racist capitalist police state. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's a great idea to have an accountability board, so to speak, or a, a way to actually have some accountability towards the people. Because right now we don't have any accountability. I mean, they answer to a police commissioner and then a mayor, and that's probably the extent to it. And yeah. they're usually right in line with what the the police are doing. In fact, many of them are probably encouraging their actions. Mm -hmm. So, I mean. But one of the things I wanted to, to bring up was a, a really interesting quote by Malcolm X. And a lot of people talk about, oh, we've made so much progress and, you know, uh, we've 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 elected a black president and all these things. But I don't I don't think we've really done the things to actually heal the wounds that have been created out of the racism of, of slavery and, and everything. Mm -hmm. And there's a really really good quote by Malcolm X in which he stated, um, I will never say that progress is being made. If you stick a knife in my back nine inches and pull it out six inches, there's no progress. Mm -hmm. You pull it all the way out, that's not progress. The progress is healing the wound that the blow, that the blow made. And they haven't even begun to pull a knife out, much less try and pull, uh, heal the wound. You have, have, you have they won't even admit the knife is there. <laughs> yeah. And I think that that quote is so powerful because as as our society, we have the tendency to, to just like, oh, ignore it. If you ignore it, somehow it'll go away. And mm -hmm. that's not how you fix the the problems that we're facing. And I mean, obviously there's no question there, but I mean, if you want to cop, co like comment on that that quote, I just think it's, it's really powerful. No, I, I think that's absolutely correct. Um, in, you know, <laughs> Uh, we we have in, in a lot of ways the uh, the civil war is incomplete, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, if that makes any sense. Because it had a chance; uh, it was on its way during the period of Reconstruction, but uh, the combination of you know uh, the federal government making compromise with the uh, southern plantation owners uh, and also looking away at uh, vigilante uh, racist terrorism, the rise, I mean, that's pretty much what started the rise of the KKK and then that just became the police department. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, um, so in, in one way or another, racism has been a foundational uh, part of maintaining power for capitalism. Um, it's been from the very begin beginning a clear way to divide and conquer uh, the working class, to have a more super exploited uh, layer of the working class. Um, so, and it, it kind of flows through all the institutions. Pretty much everything you can think of is impacted by the fact that we have essentially a civil war that was never completed. Uh, even all the symbolism of like, why were all of the so-called Confederate statues built not right after the civil war, but actually much, much later <laughs> exactly. when, when the black freedom movement was kind of starting up again as a sort of a psychological mass terror uh, as a reminder, you know, of who's in control. Um, so, yeah, I would say, yeah, the lack of admission of e the fact that even the knife is in there, I think 
that's how you see while the the laws are formally speaking colorblind uh, all of their application uh, the application is heavily heavily conditioned uh, by by racism by you know essentially the the unchanged form of I mean even slavery is continuing within our prisons you know it's like it, it was an explicit part of the 13th amendment that uh, it only banned <laughs> uh bonded uh uh you know uh b bonded labor uh if you're not in prison essentially and you, with with the, with the proliferation of prison industry even i mean even uh <laughs> even the uh the the furniture that the university of wisconsin uh uses uh a lot of it is built by Badger State Industries, which is just a, a prison labor administration uh, company, basically, uh, that like produces all of these uh, things. Um, so yeah, like that, it, you know, the only fundamental way it can be completely rooted out, essentially, like we we can and should fight institutional racism in the here and now we should fight for demands and we can certainly make progress we can certainly reduce the impact uh by building a powerful multiracial movement against uh against racism but we're never going to completely dismantle it without dismantling capitalism um because it's just always going to be in the interest of the capitalist class it's such a powerful tool for them to maintain uh, their power and rule and profits. Um, so, yeah, I think that quote is quite accurate. Just because you had uh, a black president, I mean, the reality was that the <laughs> the most historic destruction of uh, of African American income actually took place during the uh, Obama administration. Uh, Obama watched as uh, so many um, black working class folks were foreclosed upon. Uh, you know, uh, he had to be dragged, kicking and screaming to just even address issues of racism. Like, and even when he did, he was always like lecturing black folks, like you know, uh, that we should be more serious, be responsible, you know, the whole, like, uh, pull our pants up kind of. Um, he even went so far as to go, uh, you know, in a speech he gave, uh, I don't know if it was in Ghana or Uganda, I don't remember exactly, but basically, like, told Africans to stop blaming uh, colonialism. Oh, wow. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. Jesus. You know? So, and, and the fact how, yeah, the, the bailouts were engineered, uh, you know, in the 2008 crash, how the, um, how um, Bush's tax cuts were made permanent, uh, how, like, a neoliberal uh, uh, budget cuts and uh, privatization program took place with an education and that had the most devastating impact um, for black and brown kids. Um, you know, Obama was a an employee of the capitalist class. Mm. You know, yeah. plain and simple. Yeah, most definitely. I mean, I think, dude, we can have a whole discussion about, uh, As neoliber a whole several, yeah. about yeah. neoliberalism and, and crony capitalism. And uh -huh. I think honestly we should we we should come on again and talk about that because it's okay. such it's such a important topic to talk about to kind of dig into the roots of not only racism but the 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 classism uh, mm -hmm. and and the you know the the response to the COVID crisis. But um, yeah, I really appreciate you coming on here. Um, where can, like where can people get involved with Socialist Alternative? So you can uh, basically, uh, if you can email 
either uh, madison at socialistalternative.org uh, or uh, milwaukee at socialistalternative.org. But you can also look for our Facebook pages, uh, you know, Milwaukee Socialist Alternative, Madison Socialist Alternative, our national page, our website, socialistalternative.org. Uh, I would encourage folks to check into our perspectives and views uh, and, and what we're doing around the country. And if you're interested, you can just contact us through the website. And if you're interested in joining, just, you know, uh, you know, there's a form you can fill out, and somebody will uh, will contact you for sure. Uh, but yeah, if you email either Madison or or Milwaukee at socialistalternative.org, uh, you know, I'll be able to see those emails, um, and I'd be happy to talk with anybody that's either just interested in exchanging ideas, or but especially of getting involved, uh, either joining Socialist Alternative or wanting to work together on. On any projects so yeah that's pretty much it yeah well i appreciate you coming on and discussing this important topic um, we definitely got to have more uh, discussions about this in the future absolutely all right thank you andre appreciate yeah, it. it all right so we say we always say the black Panther body that they can do anything they want to us we might not be back i might be in jail i might be anywhere but when i leave you can remember i said with the last words on my 